of the killing of Hezbollah's leaders Hassan Nasrallah in southern Lebanon will lead to a larger, wider conflict there. The Israeli airstrike killed the leader of the Iran-backed terrorist group, along with other Hezbollah operatives. In a statement, President Joe Biden saying the terrorist group is responsible for killing hundreds of Americans over four decades. Biden is calling the death quote a measure of justice, while repeating calls to de-escalate tensions in the region. Back here at home, but we are just over one month away until Election Day. Democratic presidential candidate Kamala Harris made her first stop at the U.S.-Mexico border, saying she will do more to secure the border and reduce illegal border crossings. Those who cross our borders unlawfully will be apprehended and removed and barred from reentering for five years. We will pursue more severe criminal charges against repeat violators. Meanwhile, Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump continued his attack on Harris during his campaign stops in battleground states. While in Michigan, Trump criticized Harris' comment on the border. Trump referenced new federal data out on immigrations and customs enforcement that finds thousands of undocumented migrants with criminal convictions have been released in cities around the U.S. According to this brand new data never seen before, over 13,099 convicted murderers have crossed the border and are free to roam and kill in our country. These are convicted murders. Immigration, the economy, and reproductive rights are the top three issues in this presidential race. We want to bring in our political panel this morning. Mitchell Miller is the uh, 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 political correspondent and the uh, uh, joining us from WTOP Radio this morning. Greg Rothschild is Democratic strategist and partner at F. G.S. Global. Gentlemen, thank you for being with us. Um, Donald Trump now seems to have got back on message in some of these uh, recent appearances. Uh, Mitchell, this is something we have heard that the Trump campaign has been trying to get him to do for a while now. Uh, what should we make of the fact that he does seem to be listening to them a little bit more now? Well, I think he's looked at the polling, and while he publicly won't say that he is trailing in some of these states, they know that the bread and butter is immigration, and they really have to hit this hard. That's why I think you're seeing that happen now. Last night, he went again a little bit off message and caused uh, some more consternation among Republicans because he called uh, Kamala Harris mentally impaired. So they are constantly trying to get the guardrails around him to try to get him to stay on the economy and on immigration. There's always this battle around Trump of those in his camp that say, let Trump be Trump. And then the others who are trying to get him to, to stay on message. Uh, Greg, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, a little over a month until this election. Is there much these candidates can do at this point to change somebody's mind who's not already made it up? Well, if, if there is, I would say that the vice president is certainly trying to do that. You saw her have two very important events this week. She was in Pittsburgh talking about the economy. Uh, she went down to the border. You, you led with immigration because that's on so many voters' minds. And she took it straight to Donald Trump on immigration. She talked about, uh, she, she talked about more, more resources. She talked about greater technology. And she is not conceding that issue. I think, I think on, in both those speeches, she said, we understand that, that, that voters are looking seriously right now at both candidates, and we are going to put our best foot forward. And she did that, I think, in, uh, in those two events this week. One of the things the Harris campaign has been trying to do, Mitchell, of it late, is turn the mantle of incumbency onto Donald Trump, which is interesting because he's not the president of the United States. He's a former president of the United States. She's been in office uh, for the last four years. How should we interpret that? Is that a, is that a political strategy? Or is in some way she distancing herself from the Biden administration? I think this is a political strategy. It's kind of like inside-out politics because you have her as an incumbent who's been in office for more than three years, and yet she is trying to indicate that she is the candidate of change because I think her strategists and a lot of Democrats know that a lot of voters are looking for change. And, and that's why you see her kind of dismissively mm -hmm. along with Tim Walls saying, well, this is more of the same with Donald Trump. Do you really want to go back? to that. So trying to basically indicate that he is the incumbent when he's really the challenger. Whoever wins in November in the White House uh, is going to want to have a U.S. Senate of their party. And we got some news this week on the uh, Maryland uh, U.S. Senate race. Washington Post, the University of Maryland, out with a new poll showing that Democrat Angela Alsobrooks is up, they say, 11 points 
over a former Republican governor, Larry Hogan. Now, the polls found that a lot of people who answered the polls still like Larry Hogan. But when it comes down to brass techs and who they're going to vote for, also Brooks has a double-digit lead in that poll that is outside the margin of error. Uh, so, Greg, what do you make of that? People still seem to like Larry Hogan in that poll, but are saying when it comes time to decide right. who they're going to vote for, they're looking at also Brooks. So what, what's driving that? I think Maryland voters are seeing that if, if Larry Hogan, who's running a very strong campaign, uh, talking about abortion, talking about not being a Trump Republican. But I think Maryland voters are seeing that if Larry Hogan was really, you know, felt that strongly as, on abortion and, and, was, and was so against Donald Trump, he'd be supporting Angela also Brooks. And I think Maryland voters understand they are not voting for governor. They are voting for the U.S. Senate. Uh, the Senate is a very close call, and Maryland voters want to see the Senate in Democratic hands. It seemed like the Hogan campaign was able to lay a glove on Also Brooks's campaign this week with this news uh, that Also Brooks had taken uh, some tax breaks on two properties uh, which she owned, but it turned out she wasn't entitled to. One was a homestead uh, a rebate in Prince George's County; the other was meant for seniors in D.C. Uh, one of the things that the, the Hogan campaign and commercials this week has been saying that, you know, she talks about tax laws and she talks about the rules, but she's not following them. How did they handle, you know, what ostensibly was probably their, their first big pothole that they've run into uh, since Also Brooks won the Democratic nomination? Right. I think Also Brooks got nicked by this for sure, and we'll have to see how the polling plays out in connection with it. Uh, certainly when you're the Prince George's County executive who is responsible for taxation in some respects and you didn't pay your own taxes, that's a big problem. I think overall, however, the campaign handled it pretty well that she said uh, she was not aware of this. Of course, some people have skepticism about that, but ultimately says she is going to repay these taxes and that they are going to take care of it as quickly as possible. And I think that's the best way to do it. You don't want that political drip, drip, drip happen, ha going over for weeks and weeks and, and allowing Hogan to really do more political damage. Right. So we've got a, a vice presidential uh, uh, debate coming up. Uh, on Tuesday, I had wondered for some time whether or not it was actually going to happen or maybe, you know, we might get another presidential debate, although it doesn't look like right now. Uh, Greg, how important are these things? Because they're not running for president. They're, you know, the, the other name on the ticket. Do these matter? I'll, I'll say two things on that. The first is that um, I, it's never been shown that these debates really do matter. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that being said, it's a very close election. Um, it's one of those elections where everything does matter, or even those things that matter a little bit could turn things. I think the Democrats feel very good about their chances. They feel like with Tim Walls and J.D. Vance, the Democrats have their wind at the back here. So let's look at what might be their strategies on Tuesday nights. Uh, J.D. Vance, in his past life, said a lot of things about Donald Trump. Mitchell, how much of that is going to be thrown in his face on Tuesday? I think they're going to yeah. dig up everything they can on the Democratic side. Tim Walls is probably going to bring up uh, some of these questionable comments about the pets and the eating of the pets in Ohio, uh, a lot of these past comments related to abortion, the, you know, the cat lady, all of this stuff I think is going to come out. And, and I think Tim Walls is going to try to present it as this is like some kind of, as he uses the word weird, uh, there, that's going to be their strategy. And meanwhile, I think Vance is going to try to just go into Trump mode and, and say these are all baseless attacks and that we really have a plan for the economy and immigration. You know, when he first was named as the running mate, Republicans did try to tag Walls with some things. They brought up, you know, an old DUI from, from, from years ago. They talked about his, you know, uh, retiring from the military before his unit went off. How much of that could we expect J.D. Vance to bring back into this conversation? Those didn't seem to take flight when they initially were brokered. Well, I think they didn't take flight largely because Tim Walls had a fairly centrist record as a congressman, was a little more progressive as a governor, but was very popular in his state, won re-election with a big margin. And I think you'll see Tim Walls talk about his successes on that campaign. I think J.D. Vance is going to try to throw mud. Um, I don't think it'll stick any better mm -hmm. this week than it has yet. Usually, these vice presidential debates are followed by a final presidential debate. Right now, we don't have one on the calendar. There's an offer out there. Trump says he's done to, um, doesn't feel like he has to do any more. Uh, what is your sense? Do you think we'll get another one before this all wraps up? 
You know, I think it all depends on what the trend is as we get closer to the election. I think there's no question that if Donald Trump sees an opening where he needs to actually do another debate, that he will do it. So I don't think it's off the table. Greg, what do you think? Oh, I think that uh, I think that the vice president would love to do another debate. I don't think Donald Trump will do it. I'm not so sure Trump probably wants that last debate, though, as the final word. So I tend to think maybe the, the book ain't closed on that. Yet. Yeah. Uh, Greg Rothschild, Mitchell Miller, always a pleasure. We love having you at the desk. We'll have you back real soon.